Cable and satellite TV rates are climbing and a lot of Bay Area customers had to deal with a host of issues. There's a TV revolution happening. It's called cord cutting, it's on the rise and it is hitting the big players where it hurts. AT&T Inc.'s third quarter video losses sent pay TV industry shares down on Thursday. Wall Street analysts are raising concerns about the continued threat of consumers canceling their cable and satellite television subscriptions. There is a war going on. It is a war that has cost billions of dollars. It is a war that has claimed many victims. It is a war with no end in sight. It is the war for your living room. The war for your television. For these companies to succeed, they'll need to build complete ecosystems. They'll have to have all of the movies, all of the TV shows, all of the music, and some of the video games. Most of all, they'll need to convince a world of eager consumers that it's finally time to throw away the cable box. According to Gizmodo.com, if there was any doubt that traditional satellite and cable plans are on the decline, earlier this year, cord cutting hit an all-time high after more than one million subscribers ditched their services in just one quarter. Over the last 12 months, big cable and satellite providers are scrambling to find quick answers amidst massive falling subscriber numbers and piracy, which is at an all-time high in the new digital age. Yet the ultimate cloud cable solution was created in 1988 to replace all the now outdated hardware infrastructure and has maintained its course for over 20 years, awaiting the rest of the world to catch up. We are here today with Bill Mobley, who in the late 90s pioneered the streaming of major motion pictures and events to personal computers. Bill has spent the last 10 years as a visionary and CEO of Freecast, building the platform for the multi-billion dollar entertainment industry's transition from today's failing hardware home cable industry model to the billions of wireless consumer devices worldwide. Welcome, Bill. A recent article sets the tone for the discussion about big networks. Viacom's purchase of the free channel assembly service from Pluto TV for $340 million, Disney buying out AT&T's stake in the Pluto uh, Video Consortium, Comcast, NBC, they're doing their own video online pay library service. Amongst others here, what's happening? You know, panic disguised is progress for the most part. You know, there's 40% of the revenue that's falling out of the cable and satellite networks. Uh, these people ride on that service to deliver their content into these regional markets. And so now you have probably, and I use the panic word, because now they have to go and they have to find a replacement solution for that, which is the online uh, accessibility because that's where the consumer's moving. The problem is I think most of this is being done in a um, fragmented way, which is exactly the opposite of what the consumer wants, which is something where they can access it all in one place and, and through all these you know, devices they already own. That's exactly what they want. What does today's entertainment consumer look like? Well, the 40 plus crowd, these are people who are commonly known as you know, uh, couch potatoes or, or channel surfers. They have some pretty good equipment now. The cable companies have provided them with H, you know, uh, high, high definition DVRs. They've provided them with on-demand type of things that they can go back and look at shows. Yet the thing that really uh, is a problem for these types of people is, is that they're looking for solutions because ultimately it's it's probably a second issue as a, as a cost cutting thing. So you kind of drop you into them looking to try to save money because you know, you're talking about fees today that are probably about the same price as a car payment. And then your millennials, these are kids who are more on the high tech side of things. They understand they, they're going right into cord cutting. You know, so cord cutting represents the devices such as the Roku's, the Apple TV's, uh, you know, all the different Chromecast type devices, which they're, they're looking at it as the same way, a cost savings, but more importantly, they're looking at it as, well, this is a lot of devices or, and or a lot of services to kind of bring it all together in one place for me. The kids, 25 and under, they just flat steal everything. It, regardless if it's, you know, their Netflix account from their parents, you know, uh, somebody else's Amazon account, whatever it might be, or ultimately they find themselves in an awkward position because they in turn will never have a cable bill. They don't recognize a cable bill. They'll have a bandwidth bill and they'll certainly realize that, you know, unless it's 
they don't want to have 100 apps. So if it's not brought into one place for them to be able to bring it together and for them to search it all and get mm -hmm. access to it all, what do they defer to? They defer to piracy and piracy either by what I just mentioned, which is using other passwords or piracy by virtue of just going and ripping it from the net because it's inconvenient. They want to watch this movie. They want to watch this TV show. It's not, I want to buy bundles, buy packages. It's just not where they're coming from. I get the breakdown of digital media consumers. So explain to us what they think they want. Well, you know, we've done endless consumer trender panels, you know, and a lot of the people in the industry uh, have put these on and we've been doing them for years. Essentially, the first thing is accessibility. You know, there's so many devices in our lives right now that are not just the tethered cable television in my living room, you know, so it's, it's grow, grown way beyond that. I think the, the second bigger issue is you're looking at the serviceable items that bring those things to those wireless devices, which are multiple apps. I said that a moment ago. You know, if you have multiple apps and you have, you know, multiple uh, programs and services that you have to subscribe to, accessibility becomes cumbersome. Secondly is cost. You know, uh, theoretically, if we go back, bundles have been the thing that have allowed the regional cable providers to bring all these channels together on their... Um, you know, on their, be it satellite or cable provisional packages. But bundles have been sold in three pieces, right? You've had your core basic cable channels with the localized channels. You've added sports packages as bundle two. And then generally you're adding, you know, some premium channels. Most people want the high end uh, exposure of HBO, but it's going to come bundled with several others. And so those pricing models become extensive. So cost becomes extensive. Whereas if I'm looking at, the mimicking that has been done with others that have come online and created you know, products with live channels, they're essentially doing the same thing, they're bringing them bundles. So if they're rejecting the bundles at cable because, and they're rejecting all these apps, and they're certainly not gonna accept bundles when they're brought online because ultimately you're back to something where you're not giving me the a la carte capability that I'm looking for as a consumer to be able to view what I wanna watch, which is really, the essence of where the consumer's going. It's old school. They need to bring it new school. They need to bring it new school. Absolutely. You know, the third thing is personal selection. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to use the, uh, the word a la carte. We, we brought that out in the press about five years ago at NAB because we thought it was essential. And a lot of the, the trender panels that I speak to, uh, you know, we've been preaching a la carte for a long time. And yet, the consumer and their personal is not going to rush home to watch The Voice anymore at 8 o'clock. There's some people that do because it's very powerful and it's, you know, it makes them feel associated with that program. But because of people's busy schedule and because a life has just changed, and again, I'm walking around with a tablet, a mobile phone, I'm, I'm in the airport, I'm moving from here to there, I'm at my kid's ball game. You know, my ability to watch things either live or on demand, other than certainly sports, and I have kids that play sports, it's, it's very, very important to watch a sports event live. But when it comes down to the rest of the things, I'm trying to fit it in when I have time. My wife and I on a Sunday afternoon, we may put, you know, three house hunters together because that's something that interests us. My wife may put three yes to the dresses together. But at the end of the day, it boils down to accessibility at any given point in time, which backs up the theory behind a la carte. And that's key right now. And again, um, you know, having less components to be able to access that is going to be, you know, a very key element here, which is being overlooked and everyone trying to create their own sandbox and isolate their content behind paywalls and those types of things. It's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not giving that cross ability for the consumer to go get I like this show on that network I like this on that network and regardless if it's you know free with ads for some of the older content or if it's premium charges a la carte could work in a very simple way it had you know it has for, for many other industries certainly a la carte is brilliant it's the only way to go so why are these big networks and studios ignoring a la carte well it's the structure it's the way it was you know laid out over the last 30 years with cable and satellite. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's regionalized because the distributors have the hardwire infrastructure going to the homes or, you know, through the sky. But it's uh, also in the, the licensing side of the content. Uh, transmission fees are what is, you know, um, paid to the networks by these cable companies. So transmission fees, uh, or trans fees as they're called, are a very important part of this process. If I get XYZ in Orlando for 
you know, an ABC channel and New York gets XYZ for an ABC channel. It's based on the market, the price they'll bear, and that's the revenue. So these big networks um, who produce content and these studios who produce content, they need those trans fees. So it's not like I'm going to turn this off and turn this on. They need those trans fees to continue running their operations. But at the same time, you're watching this cord cutting audience dissipate from that hardwired infrastructure because again, we're walking around with devices that are wireless that, you know, let, let's go beyond that. We're, we have devices every place in our home and even refrigerators have, have, you know, TV screens on them today. And then, you know, the devices that are sitting on the counters that can provide you streaming are not necessarily TV. So it's, it's, you know, it's a balance issue and, and ultimately trans fees are the key element here for these affiliates in the markets who have, you know, establish that infrastructure. In Orlando, I have my ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, all those networks have established infrastructure to bring from the national feed and distribute it into the local market. So those trans fees are the key element here that uh, need to be dealt with. And certainly, uh, you know, one of the things that we offered originally, again, going back is Freecast, we said, listen, let's pay three or four X the trans fees to bring it online. And let's do that with the localized operators so the affiliates continue to make revenue. The uh, networks and, and studios continue to get paid for the, providing the content. So the distribution is there. And you know we, we see that as a reasonable solution. Again, getting back to bringing it into a place where a la carte makes sense because if I'm an ABC watcher, NBC watcher CBS, I may pay XYZ per channel to have that available, but I should have a punch list and I go boom, 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 boom. These are the nine channels I watch because that happens to be the percentage of what a consumer really watches today is about nine channels that they focus on. But if I want to go to something because in a big event is going to be available on a primary network, I should be able to buy that a la carte pay-per-view as well. So no one's missing out, but yet I understand bundling because bundling allows the operators to bring other content that's still, let's call it semi-popular. And that's why you see syndication and other things coming about in the markets. But also, maybe that's where the split is. Premium is paid in the a la carte market. And in the syndication market, we kind of look at something that's more of the advertising driven model. And today, advertising on the internet is so much more targeted. So if I know that you were looking at you know, tents because your family's going camping, I should have the ability to target and market you so that you're looking, I mean, you guys every see, eyeball. see it every day in email. Every eyeball has is, is, is got a connection, unlike uh, advertising in the past. That's absolutely correct. So taking advantage of that and earning probably larger revenues in advertising than throwing the big white net on TV, because you don't know who's watching those ads, other than some geographical variable, is key here. There's a lot of opportunities. A hundred percent. Just like the death of landline phones. You know, we're seeing that come about here with, you know, cable in some ways. Certainly bandwidth is still going to be a huge variable here. And, and the provision of bandwidth is key. Um, what you have to think through is, is the consumer takes all of these things in account, these devices, having bandwidth, flexibility, accessibility, cost. Now let's add into it having something to manage that in one account. You know, that's really where we tried to put our focus because ultimately everybody's going to have a pay service and everybody is going to digitize their content. It's going to be a question of how you manage that. And, you know, no different than what Microsoft, let's face it. I mean, we're certainly not Microsoft, but let's face what happened when we all had X. T type computers and we were typing all those little lines, you know, back and forth uh, of code. And then one day somebody gave us a click and, and, and a point interface. That was key. And that's the same kind of thing here. People want all this stuff in one account. So it's one thing to talk about all the a la carte and here and there and all the different networks and bundles. It's another thing to bring it all together and something that they can use on all these devices. All the things that their, their preferences and everything in one account on you know, one service that they can aggregate it all from. And that's really where we focus both on the front end to the consumer with Smart Guide, but on the back end with our infrastructure to be able to input the data and manage the data to the consumer so they can have access to all that content. Freecast is definitely setting the, a, a big way forward for everybody. Yeah, it's, we're, we focused on the consumer side because we knew that that was going to be the controlling interest because of these devices and the way that things are being consumed. Let's call it what it is. I think the younger generations are going to really get you. Well, and, and, in, and even so, that mid-tier millennial group that's now hitting the, you know, to stride at 27 to 38, yep. those people are, you know, adapting cord cutting. At the same time, they're segueing out of the convenience of cable. 
But again, because of cost, you're looking at a car payment, it all of a sudden makes sense to a young family to start looking at new ways. And it probably fits their lifestyle more with being able to watch things on their own time. So these latest announcements by the networks to each build pay platforms for their own content doesn't seem to line up with that concept. No, it doesn't because there's a separation here. You know, the networks and the studios produce the content and they're, again, they're looking just to get directly to the consumer because they're non-serviced by the cable and satellite groups. But yet, when you look at it, the first thing is let's go hire the young tech entrepreneurs to come on board at the networks. They essentially want to throw a paywall around all the content. And when that happens, they work for one company that has a single focus you know, agenda, which is to deliver that content, that content only. The, the, the problem there is the consumer, again, is not single focused or single minded when it comes to content. Comedy is comedy. If I'm interested in comedy, I want to look at comedy. But again, I don't want to have multiple accounts. Netflix, great product, totally engage the consumer on on-demand streaming content library. Their original goal was to take out Blockbuster by mailing DVDs to your house. They go online. They, but what people are figuring out with Netflix is they don't have all the content. They, so what is Netflix doing? Netflix is making a big move to be content uh, as a priority to develop their own, just like an HBO. Because Netflix is really more like an HBO, ESPN, where content in their eyes is the value proposition that they bring to the table. Certainly, they have great membership uh, numbers. But at the end of the day, everybody's out to get a piece of that. And well, so what are we all doing? We're all sharing the same eyeballs, right? Mm -hmm. But come back to reality. If you're the consumer, are you going to want to have 27 accounts, 35 apps, my credit card with multiple places, you're not. It's, it's not logical, it's not practical. It, it, it's, you know. It gets you into trouble. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a risk. So piracy, again, is not 100% being driven by this idea of just stealing content and, and because I don't have to pay for it. It's being driven because people are being told in the market that I can go get a Cody box which unfortunately they can go buy anywhere in the United States. And they unfortunately can, they have easy access to these programs of piracy. And it, it allows them to feel comfortable in doing it, although it's illegal and none of us want that. But it, the problem that they have is, is that they're not getting it just as easy from the variety of products that the consumer would like to access. And I'll give you a simple example, okay. iTunes iTunes, the iPod was the device. iTunes made a library available of all the music. Later on, the, you know, the, the labels and the, and the artists come together and said, wait a minute, you know, we can put our own stuff on here. Well, that's going to happen right now with this. So the sooner that there's a marketplace, which is, and we feel there's a guide for it, just like the iTunes software was, the manager of the media in your iTunes device. We just want to be that for all the devices and streamline that whole thing down to one account. So, I, you know, not talking about us as the, you know, the only solution, because there's many people out there being very successful. But you have to look at this as a solution that is a common sandbox approach to the consumer's eyes and not a common paywall that I'm going to put around on my content because I'm ABC or uh, the family of products, be it Disney or I'm the NBC Comcast group. If you do that, you're isolating your, your consumer with that paywall. And that could be the break that you don't want. Yes. Bill, why would they deliberately ignore online consumer revenues? They desperately need these in, until these latest moves happen. You know, I think collectively they haven't worked together. That's probably the biggest thing. Again, you know, as I just mentioned, they, is they, they bring their teams in, they isolate the content, which is practically smart. You need to get it online and digitized and, and ready to service. But working together is going to be a key thing to meet the consumer demands. And examples, um, you know, CISO and NBC comes out, put a pay channel. CBS All Access puts on a pay line. If you are pushing the consumer into a direction of only you, you're pushing them away. That's just, there's no other way to say it. You know, I mean, 
these awesomeness TVs and all these channels that have come out that are what we'll call subsets of their core content because they're protecting these licenses, that agreements that they have with their regional affiliates. Listen, bring everybody in, bring the regional affiliates in. They have local news, they have local sports, they have things that the consumer wants as well. And in fact, highly popular stuff. And yet when the networks bring in their primetime content and aggregate that content, you just look at the bundles today. The bundles today are often not focused on the local versions of those. Sling came out, what were you getting? I believe it was either New York or somebody's content. If I'm a guy in Wichita, Kansas, I could care less about that. And ultimately, you're making people bounce. They're bouncing from service to service. That's another thing that's happening. We're throwing free trials out there left and right because, again, we're trying to hook consumers. We're not playing a practical game. The consumer comes in, puts in his credit card, runs it for a month, two months, realizes you know, that all the content's not in a Netflix, all the content's not in a, in a Hulu group because these are consortium groups that have pulled together their stuff. But yet, the funny thing is, if I'm in you know, Hulu, then they've got Will Ferrell movies, and I, I'm watching, you know, uh, Ricky Bobby, uh, Talladega Nights, and Step Brothers this month. I'm paying for it in my subscription, but why is next month it's free on Sony Crackle or whoever may be the production group of that? Because it's not licensed in that group anymore this month. It's now moved out, and now you're looking at semi-pro and, you know, old school with Will Ferrell. It's rotating out. So these things are key in trying to you know, really slow down, take a good look at it, come together, talk about how we aggregate the content in a way the consumer can get it, and all the different layers that they should be offering it. I don't disagree with bundling in some way per network or per studio. I disagree with the idea that if you're going to do that, they should be able to access the others and not at $10, $15, 20, because by the time I put six or seven of those together, I think, you know, maybe the concept today is it drives them back to cable because, well, if I'm going to do that, I can go back to cable because I'm already spending $100 a month again. That's not the focal point here. They didn't like cable. It's probably one of the worst customer service experiences, I think, rated by many of the, the you know, the service agents. Everybody hates it. Yeah, they don't like it. So why not feed the, the value proposition because everybody says, I'm going to lose money. No, it's because you have... The guys who've been in this business for a long time at the top of these networks, they jump down, they grab a bunch of kids to try to come out and sort out their digital plan and what's missing. I spend more dinners in New York talking to guys who are the mature gentlemen who've, who've you know, been with these networks for many years. And I probably am the best interpreter of why, the, I don't understand what our kids are doing in this digital thing and why. So for us, it's been, a, it's been a learning experience, and we continue to take that back, and we deliver that, that logic back to them and say, hey, we, I'll give you one more example that we did for these guys last year, the network plans. So essentially, we went to the networks, and we said, listen, I can tell you who's watching The Voice now, who's moving over and watching Blue Bloods on CBS, and who just watched Grey's Anatomy. I can tell you from network to network where they're moving. Now, it's one thing that you're getting that traffic from us and those eyeballs from us on your shows, but you don't know what the makeup of that individual is. So as a Christmas present, we sent those out to the networks and said, hey, here you go. Here's the, 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 the profile of the users and the age groups and what they're watching. How valuable is that information? Because if you're building content on the other side, do you, you want to know who's watching it? You need, to make a, you need to pay a lot of attention. You know your markets in general by network, but do you know your markets in general beyond the network? Probably not. So a lot of that's very important to what we do and what we bring to the table. And again, not to just pump us in this subject matter, but it's the logic set that I'm really talking about today. We're just implementing the logic set. It's it's key to know who, what who those eyeballs are. Certainly, certainly. It's the only way forward. Absolutely. Bill, how does your platform resolve what appears to be multi-millions of dollars that are at stake globally for the entertainment giants? You know, the best answer is, you know, we're the cable company in the sky. You know, probably the doppelganger for the hardwired cable satellite, uh, you know, operators that you know today. Uh, in, in both front end and back end. You know, on the front end, we, we aggregate the data. We bring it in so that the consumer can see it in the different types of ways that they want to receive it. Be it channels, on demand, uh, live events 
pay-per-view, including a comparison variable from Amazon to Voodoo. So if the latest rock movie comes out, what's its, you know, uh, one-day rental, two-day rental, standard definition, high definition, $399, $599. There's a comparison. There's music, music to the degree that there's 70,000 radio stations, world channels. So if I can bring all that to you in some place where the data is managed and you can pick and choose what you want to watch at any given time, we're most of the way there. And when our back infrastructure can support that, that's key. You're simplifying delivery. You know, the, and the best part about the back end is the, the networks can manage the data. We can manage the licensing. We can manage the advertisement for the networks and, and content producers. And so, therefore, all the content and everything is managed for them in that system. So, so for soup to nuts, it's, it's very important. Regardless of all the additional vendors that come from the industry, which are great, um, and as far as production of those things, it's very important to have all that in place because monetizing that and for them to get their money to flow through, all transactions, everything are managed in the system. So it's key for them to have a common sandbox for them to be able to participate to bring the consumer what they want. Simplification is the key here. Absolutely. So this is very revealing, Bill, and certainly positive sounding for consumers' interests. But how does Freecast uh, flip these huge giants thinking around? You know, next, the, the, the mobile companies will be bringing 5G. You know, and this is something that they have to think about, which is going to be another form of delivery. And, you know, that's going to take the place of cable hardwired into the home. You're just going to get a little box. You're going to plug it into the wall. It's going to come from the mobile providers. And once that happens, you know, we also have to think about accommodating those technologies. So another thing that Freecast does is accommodates that technology in that future by having all these things aggregated into one. It's one thing that we can manage the, the, the content, the transactions, but having it available for the new delivery systems is also very important to these networks. It's important for us to, or, and content providers, so it's important for us to make sure we have all those pieces incorporated into this thing. Freecast has already thought about our future, and I think people are going to buy into it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.